Um, we have an exciting pre, uh, presenter today, plenary speaker, Dr. Michael Summers. He is the uh, New Horizons team member from NASA, and he is a professor of planetary science and astronomy at George Mason University. And he's going to give us all the good news about the recent Pluto flyby. Welcome, Dr. Summers. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much for the um, invitation to speak here and, and the nice introduction. Um, I do feel a little bit awkward talking about Pluto at a conference on Mars, <laughs> but um, I figured that since both Mars and Pluto are planets, that, that, uh, that Pluto would have a lot of friends here, right? Um, I appreciate the clapping. Um, I would, I would urge you to write letters to the International Astronomical Union, uh, to your congressman, to to the president and to Mike Brown at Caltech, whose uh, email address is it, well, never mind. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, okay, I'm going to talk about Pluto and the New Horizons mission, which, uh, uh, if you've been following the news, uh, the New Horizons spacecraft just went by Pluto. Closest approach was on July 14th. And uh, uh, truth be told, I'm not even over uh, my sleep deprivation. Uh, living in um, a hotel for about 40 days, and I just got back last week. And we just jumped right in to data analysis from the encounter mode. So uh, I'm going to give you some preliminary uh, thoughts uh, on, on uh, the encounter, show you some pictures. Um, I want to first of all say that even though the encounter was only a month ago, this project started much, much longer than that ago. Uh, 25 years ago, we were talking about a Pluto mission and scoping out how that would, that would work. Meetings, white papers, uh, more meetings, more telecons, and proposals, and then reproposals, and then re reproposals. And finally, in 2001, we wrote the winning proposal. 2003, started uh, building the spacecraft, launched in 2006, and we just got there. So it's a mission that takes a lot, of, um, a lot of work, obviously, a lot of persistence, patience, and in particular, a, a great team. And that is what we had, a team led by Southwest Research Institute and Alan Stern as the principal investigator. Um, so I'm gonna talk, uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, background on, on Pluto and its moon, Sharon. It's gonna be brief, because I know you're not that interested in the history. I wanna tell you a little bit about the mission uh, and the encounter, and that's what I'll spend most of the time talking about, what we've learned so far, uh, and uh, I want to say a little bit about what's to come. Now, there are a few caveats here. Uh, we have less than 5% of the data downloaded from the, the spacecraft. During the encounter, the spacecraft was so busy that taking data that we were not in communication with it. And it stored this data on the spacecraft, and over the next year or so, it's going to be uh, downlinking that data to us. But at this point, we have just a few percent of the data. And much of that data has not been released to the public yet. It's still embargoed. Um, and we're in very early stages in, uh, in the analysis and interpretation of the data. Um, and so we're going to have, with more data, we're going to have more surprises and, and, and maybe uh, some changes in our perspective and our interpretations. Also, uh, my field is atmospheric sciences, uh, but there's a lot more to Pluto than the atmosphere. I'll be showing you things that relate to its surface and geology, um, but what I say about those things are not sayings of an expert, more of an amateur. Uh, so pretty much everything I say today is subject to change without notice, uh, just to give you that, that, that warning. Okay, so this is the double planet system that, that I'm going to be talking about. And um, uh, you, you've probably heard a lot about Pluto and Charon, and you know pretty much where it is. Um, it, it, no disrespect, but on this figure, you can't see the orbit of Mars. Okay, uh, you can see the orbits of the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and then you see the orbit of, of Pluto out there, which is inclined and a little bit eccentric compared to the other, uh, the other planets. So it is very far away right now, a little over 32 astronomical units from the Sun, um, Mars 1.52 or so, and so it is, you know, an outer solar system object, and I'll talk more about that, those types of object, objects in a minute. Being so far away, it has a long year. Uh, it was discovered in 1930, and it has not completed one Pluto year since then. 
years, uh, 248 Earth years. Um, it was at perihelion, close to the sun, closest to the sun in 1989. Um, and uh, it's, um, uh, it'll take it another 115 years or so to complete uh, its uh, transverse to its aphelion. So it's a, it's a really a, a, a long period object. Uh, before New Horizons, we did know quite a bit about Pluto. We had a pretty good uh, estimate of its average distance, its size, uh, its radius, um, its mass. Uh, we knew that it was not like the terrestrial planets, rock and metal. It had to be made up of ices. And we knew it was cold, um, in incredibly cold, 35 to 40, maybe 45 degrees Kelvin. And we also knew that in the region of the solar system where it resides, there are many other objects uh, of which Pluto is the largest, but we call these Kuiper Belt objects. Over a thousand have been discovered, and estimates are that there are tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand of them out there. So that would make it the most common type of planet in the, in the solar system. Here's just a cartoon to kind of illustrate that Pluto, as it goes in and out in its uh, elliptical orbit, kind of uh, transverses this Kuiper belt of um, dwarf ice planets in the outer solar system. And like I said, we know uh, about some of these uh, quite a lot. Here are a few of the more well-studied Kuiper belt objects in the outer solar system, just to compare it to some of the large objects in the, uh, the asteroid belt, like Ceres and, and Orcus and Varuna. And we, and surprisingly, we even know a little bit about the surface brightness variation on Pluto. And this comes about from Hubble Space Telescope uh, studies of how the light varies during its rotation and during uh, mutual eclipses with the, the satellite. So we know it's got some variegated terrain of some sort, uh, or at least we knew that before we went into the mission. We also knew that Pluto had an atmosphere, and we had discovered that by looking at Pluto moving in front of background stars. And as the light dims, um, you can uh, see that it's not instantaneous. It dims gradually, as you'd expect, if there was an atmosphere extending out from Pluto. In fact, you can use that extension, the rate of extension of the atmosphere, to say a lot about its temperature, its composition, and then you can infer things about how the atmosphere works. Uh, we know that the atmosphere is nitrogen and methane. We knew that before the New Horizons mission. And from the from inferences that there's nitrogen and methane there and the surface albedo, you can even deduce things about the methane distribution on the surface. And so this was one of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, this, this is one of the maps that we had of the methane distribution that we expected going into the mission. Okay, so there were quite a few things that we knew. Um, and then the encounter, okay? This is, uh, this is the, uh, well, I'm not gonna talk, I'm gonna say a little bit about the background first. Uh, the, the mission itself, the New Horizons mission, um, this is um, our team in 2001 uh, writing the winning proposal to go to, uh, to Pluto. And you can usually pick me out uh, I'm on the left up in the upper left hand corner there because I'm, I always have the specular reflection off my forehead. It's really bright right there. Um, 2001, the proposal won, 2004, building, testing, and then launching in 2006. The spacecraft has uh, several instruments. Uh, REX is the radio science instrument that, that is the antenna, communicates with the Earth. SWAP and Pepsi are particle and fields measurements. Uh, Lori Ralph, imagers. And then ALICE is an ultraviolet spectrograph. And then SD, SDC is a student dust counter, built and uh, operated by students at the University of Colorado. Here's a picture getting ready for launch in 2006. And this is my favorite launch picture, uh, January 19th, uh, 2006. Uh, quite an event. Uh, I remember the, the launch pretty vividly. If you ever get a chance to go see a launch, do it. it it'll just it'll almost change your life. Um, after the launch, um, we had a party at the hotel, went and caught a flight back to Baltimore. By the time I got back to Baltimore, the spacecraft had passed the orbit of the moon. It was the fastest spacecraft ever launched uh, from Earth at the time, 36,370 miles an hour. Um, and at that speed, it still took two and a half months to pass 
the orbit of Mars, a little over a year to pass the orbit of Jupiter, and nine years, of course, to get to, to Pluto. We even sped it up a bit by borrowing a little bit of momentum from Jupiter, actually stealing a little bit of momentum from Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter won't miss it, and that sped us up a little bit uh, so that we were able to get to Pluto in, in 2015 instead of um, about two years later. Uh, during the proposal and building process of the spacecraft, we knew that Pluto had one moon Charon. Two more were discovered around the time of the launch, and just recently, last few years, two more have been discovered. So we knew that there were five moons that we would be able to study with the mission. That orange cross right there shows where we were aiming uh, uh, in terms of the spacecraft's trajectory uh, getting close to Pluto about 12,500 kilometers from Pluto. This is a little bit better uh, uh, in our cartoon of the trajectory showing how Pluto would go through the plane of the satellites into uh, uh, the New Horizons, go in the plane of the satellites, in the, the shadow of Pluto and Charon, so that we could look at the sun's dimming as it went behind Pluto and the Earth's dimming as it went behind Pluto to get um, uh, some occultation measurements. And the encounter was uh, pretty, pretty incredible. I like to find one picture or one image or one cartoon that kind of illustrates projects and, and how you feel about them as they come together. And I couldn't find one for Pluto, but I, there is this, um, uh, this montage of images I want to show you that kind of illustrates how you feel if you've been working on a mission like this for 30 years. Whoops, let me go back. A little bit of trouble here with the, Let's see if this works. I'll play it again if you don't catch all of it. From a small smudge of light to mountains, ice mountains on, on Pluto. Just amazing when you, when you study something for so long, it's just a tiny bit of light to now have detailed pictures of its surface and see such a complex, interesting, interesting object. Of course, our first big image um, of the encounter, the one that, uh, the, that was released to the press that showed Pluto's heart, was pretty spectacular. I mean, who would have guessed that Pluto had a heart, right? Um, we, we know that every planet has its own sort of personality, but Pluto has a heart as well. We knew that there was a bright spot on this hemisphere, and so the encounter was arranged so that we would be able to image this when we got close. This is not true color, this is the, uh, the actual color as you would see it. And I sometimes call this the other red planet. Um, Mars tends to be a little bit red, so you might cons consider that our, my comparison with Mars for the talk. Uh, that, that heart is made up of a couple of different components, the largest of which is a solid nitrogen glacier. And that glacier is a little over a million cubic kilometers of frozen nitrogen. It's young, geologically speaking, no impact craters on it. On top of that nitrogen ice glacier, we see other ices, carbon monoxide in particular. We see um, uh, what appears to be a layer, a fairly thick layer of carbon monoxide that blows towards the east on Pluto and the, I guess on Pluto's left ventricle, to you it would be on the right, that white area, it looks like windblown ice away from the heart. So that area is really complicated and young. That's an interesting aspect of this. There is methane, a lot of methane over the surface and varies a lot from one place to the other. So that's telling you that there's a lot of ice transport it has a complicated methane cycle, a bit like the hydrological cycle on the Earth, but made up of methane. Surface features are um, quite interesting. Um, uh, the heart is just one piece of those interesting surface features. There are, there are others. There are, there are a few very large impact craters. Uh, there's a circular feature you can see in the right image there that appears to be a, an impact crater. There are other areas that you can see on the right figure to the right of it that look like uh, large chasms or canyons. Um, uh, and they're fairly extensive, uh, hundreds of kilometers in scale. When you project the 
map the images uh, and make a montage of the images of Pluto, you get something like this. And as we were getting close to Pluto, of course, we didn't have the benefit of these high resolution pictures, but we did nickname some of these features. Can you see the whale? It sure looked like a whale to us. Can you see the donut? To the right? You know, so it has a heart and a whale and a donut. Very diverse, very diverse terrain. And we have some interesting names for them now. Of course, they're informal names. They're not official names. But we called the heart, at least the right ventricle of the heart, the, the Tombaugh Regio, after Clyde Tombaugh for the discovery. The large dark area is just as interesting as the heart, right adjacent to each other, very dark terrain, the darkest region on Pluto, right next to some of the brightest terrain. In fact, the boundary between the two is just an incredibly sharp boundary. It's just a few kilometers across, right down to the limit of resolution. That's interesting. We don't quite know what causes that yet, but it's got to be some sort of tra ice transport instability. The heart itself has a lot of interesting features. Here is a, uh, a compilation of several high resolution images of the, of, again, the right ventricle of Pluto's heart. Tom Regio. I don't have a laser pointer, so I'm going to walk over here and point out a few things. The large area at the top, we call that Sputnik, Sputnik Planum. And you'll see that it's very bright. And at the top regions, it looks like broken up pieces of that bright uh, thing, whatever it is. It's a, probably like a glacier. There are valleys on both sides of it, and in particular, mountains. We see mountain ranges down here in the southern part of it, and also uh, on to the, over here on the right. And the inter again, the interesting thing here is that this is young. There are no impact craters on this. When we look at high resolution at this glacier, this nitrogen glacier, we see, um, again, very smooth surfaces, but broken up into what appears to be polygonal type terrain. And it's not just broken up. The fractures between the polygons appear to be filled with something, something dark. You can even see some of these regions right here. We still don't have the elevation uh, inferences on this yet, whether that's a low area or a high area, but it looks like it might be high. Something sticking through the fractures between these different polygons. And there's evidence that this flows. When you look at the glacier and its juxtaposition next to the mountains, you can see that it's not sharp. It's a demarcation that has had boundaries that have moved recently. You can see that the glacier has flowed around the mountains. Kind of interesting. Some of the, the mountains stick up about two kilometers above the, the surface. I'm not sure if you can see it here, but the mountain sides appear to be scalloped. They appear to be striped as you go down the sides of them. This one is just a little bit better. And from this, you can determine um, an estimate of the, the heights of these mountains. This is at least a kilometer, maybe two kilometers high. And from that, and knowing a little bit about the rheology of the different ices, nitrogen, water ice, and so on, you can deduce that these have to be water ice mountains. Nitrogen ice wouldn't have the tensile strength to sustain itself, even in Pluto's weak gravity. Here's. Um, what I consider one of the best images that shows the, the flow of the glacier. Again, Sputnik Planum, this is the upper left-hand corner of the, um, of the previous image I showed you. This is the highest resolution. The polygonal cells down here, their dark boundaries or interfaces. Um, you can see that there's a sharp boundary as the, the glacier hits the mountains. But in some areas, it looks like it's, it's found waves in between the mountains, and it's flowed through them. Again, the solid nitrogen ice, a glacier, like glacier motion on the Earth. And you could even see the flow fields, if you look closely enough, on the edges of the glacier. Um, so OK, so moving on, the southern part of Sputnik Planum. Now here, we, we begin to see some features that look a little bit like terrain that you might be familiar with. Here is a 
circular feature and another one right here that are probably impact craters. There are a few on, on Pluto, not in the, the heart, not on Sputnik Planum itself, but around the edges you can see uh, in what appear to be impact craters. This is about 40 kilometers across, but you see it appears to be filled in from the ice. The glacier may have flowed into uh, this crater. The mountains do stick up all around the edge above the ice. Um, I guess that's all, that's all I'll say on that. Sharon, okay, um, more surprises. Uh, Sharon is small, 600 kilometers or so in diameter. And this is the object that we expected to be rather bland. We knew that it was rather gray. And the color uh, is a lot like the color of many asteroids that we've seen in high resolution that show a, a saturation of craters and, and rather old terrain. Um, we couldn't have been more surprised. We see very smooth terrain on Charon. Um, again, large areas with no impact features. We see chasms, a lot like Valles Marineris on Mars, hundreds of kilometers across. We see that Charon has a dark pole. Now, up there in the, in the top is Charon's North Pole, and you can see it appears to be dark. We were able to see that dark pole from a distance, from some of the very low resolution images as we were going into the Pluto system. But as we got closer, we saw that that dark region, that dark pole, was superimposed over another feature, which looks like a basin. That's an interesting juxtaposition. We're not quite sure what that means either. Both of those features are dark and probably have different sources. Uh, there are a few impact craters. Here is an indication of one right here, another one right here. Um, and uh, some of the, let me show you the chasm in the next figure. It's a little bit better to see it here. You can see the, the uh, shadows of some of the cliffs of the chasms uh, into the, the valley itself here. Other features which are kind of bizarre actually, this is what we call a mountain in a moat, a depression in the surface of Sharon, and into the center of that depression, a mountain. So how do you get something like that? Uh, is the mountain placed there afterwards, or was the mountain before and the surface rose up around it? It's an interesting question. Again, right now we still have only partial data back on the images of Sharon, but we have enough to see that the entire surface is most likely covered in very large scars. The high resolution images show that pretty clearly, but the low resolution images have hints of similar features. Here's one, and I think over here you can see some other things that look like large linear type features. So as we get more high resolution data back from Sharon, we're gonna see that's a very interesting object. Again, rather young, geologically speaking. Um, now, I'm not a geologist, and I'll just repeat what I've heard, but some geologists suggest that this may be even younger than many of the areas on the surface of Mars. Hundreds of millions of years, not billions of years. Um, again, we have names. These are very informal names. Uh, don't quote me on these. These have to go again to this, our famous illustrious International Astronomical Union to, to, uh, to get official names, but we've tried to uh, acknowledge people that have done significant work on, on uh, Pluto and Charon in the history. In addition to a few um, uh, science fiction authors, here's Clark, Kubrick, there's Spock Crater, Kirk Crater, Uhura. Uh, up there we have Skywalker Crater, and just to be fair, there's Vader Crater. Um, again, those are informal names. So what does it look like? What's, what's the, the the, I mean, the, the color like. Well, this is an exaggeration of the color just to bring out the differences in the composition and the terrain. So, but it's the same for both objects, for both Pluto and Charon. And you can see there are a lot of differences. That combined with the fact that much of the surfaces are young tells you there's been a lot going on on these surfaces throughout in the last hundreds of millions of years. Now, again, these objects are small. They're in the outer solar system. They should have cooled off. They should be dead, according to our sort of standard theories on the energetics of small objects like this. And yet they're not. We don't know what that energy source is. 
What has caused this resurfacing? What has caused this movement of surface material? Now, there are other uh, moons, and I'm not going to say a whole lot about them. Here is to scale Pluto and Charon with the four other moons, uh, Hydra and Nix and Kerberos and Styx, and just show you a couple of pictures. These look more like your typical asteroids. This is Nix and Hydra. But there are differences and interesting things even here. This is exaggerated color, but Nix is clearly more reddish or more purplish than Hydra. And what causes that? What causes a, a difference in the color of these objects? Is it compositional or has something happened to the surface since the formation? And this is my area uh, of research, the uh, atmospheres. So we, we were looking uh, for an atmosphere in Charon, and we were going to study uh, the atmosphere of Pluto that we knew that was there. So I'll talk about Charon first. And the way we were going to look for an atmosphere on Charon was to look at radio signals beamed from the Earth to the spacecraft to the Rex instrument as the spacecraft went behind Charon. Now, just like in a stellar occultation, if there was an atmosphere, there should have been a gradual dimming of the radio signal as the spacecraft went behind Charon. But we did not see that. Uh, that doesn't prove that Charon doesn't have an atmosphere, but it, it does suggest that if, if Charon has an atmosphere, it's got to be fairly thin. We have much more data coming in on this, and so we'll be able, able to say more about this in the coming months. Pluto, on the other hand, was incredibly interesting. This is um, an occultation of the atmosphere of Pluto taken by the ALICE uh, instrument. As ALICE looked at the sun, going behind Pluto, you look at sunlight dimming, and that's the red and the white dots that you can see, and the timeline is on the bottom here, lap, elapsed seconds from the midpoint of this occultation. And you can see flat signal, that's where you see the sunlight unocculted by the atmosphere, and then this gradual decrease about 1,000 kilometers out from Pluto. It decreases first, we can identify an extended nitrogen atmosphere, on Pluto, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Then as we get closer, we can see um, absorption due to other constituents in the atmosphere that's not nitrogen, probably methane. And then as we get very close, we can see a rapid decrease in the uh, so sunlight that's due to absorption, we think, by an atmospheric haze. And I'll say more about the haze in a minute as well. An interesting thing is that if you just flip the occultation in reverse, instead of going forward in time, going reverse in time, you see that the, it looks almost identical. That tells you that the atmosphere is very symmetric, at least from, from the, this, this data that we have. Would it be possible to get those lights down just a little bit? Some of these uh, figures need a little bit lower lighting to, to see very well. OK, first of all, the, the, uh, the extended nitrogen atmosphere. We had a pretty good sense that Pluto was going to have a very extended atmosphere. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> um, and this kind of illustrates uh, that. <laughs> OK, bear, bear with us. We'll get it right eventually. Um, well, this is the Earth. This is Pluto over here. And what I've tried to indicate is the extent of the atmosphere. So you can probably see the dashed line. That represents the uppermost portion of the atmosphere for the Earth and Pluto, the, the uppermost portion defined in terms of where the atmosphere stops behaving like a fluid. For the Earth, if you look at the volume of the atmosphere, it's about 6% of the volume of the Earth. If you look at Pluto, the atmosphere extends so far out, about seven times the radius of Pluto, that the volume is over 300 times the volume of Pluto itself. Very extended atmosphere. And what that means, being so extended, means that because of Pluto's low gravity, that atmosphere is flowing off into space as a fluid, and we call that hydrodynamic escape. So the obs observations of the, of the extended atmosphere uh, support this notion that the atmosphere is extended and it is flowing off into space. The fact that it's symmetric is kind of interesting because the occultation points were on opposite sides of the planet, one over the heart region, the other on the other side of the planet, and we see no differences between the two. That may be telling us that the surface ice distribution doesn't really have much of an impact on the global distribution of the atmosphere. Um, but we have a lot more to say. 
the ALICE instrument looked at the spectrum of reflected sunlight in the ultraviolet. And um, these are, again, some of the very preliminary images. What we see uh, is absorption in the atmosphere due to hydrocarbons. This is a, a measure of the, the observed reflected sunlight as a function of wavelength. This is angstroms here. This is the ultraviolet. And you can see absorption by acetylene and by ethylene. Two hydrocarbons, which were predicted to be there, and now that we've confirmed that they're there and we have their abundances. So now we've confirmed that there is indeed atmospheric chemistry going on that's confer converting methane into higher hydrocarbons. Now, on other outer planet atmospheres like uh, Triton and Titan, uh, we've seen a similar type process going on where methane is converted into things that we call tholins. In fact, the reddish color of Pluto is probably a result of this happening in the atmosphere of Pluto. How would this work? Well, here is a cartoon of what happens on one of the moons of Saturn. This is Titan. We see sunlight and charged particles from the magnetosphere of Saturn hitting methane and nitrogen, breaking apart those molecules into more reactive components, which initiate a sequence of reaction building up hydrocarbons and nitriles up to benzene, and then ion molecule reactions acting on those to convert those into tholins. They condense into aerosol particles and then coat the surface. We think that that is what happens on Pluto. That is where the reddish color comes from, from tholins. So I'm going to see if this works. I had trouble just a little while ago, uh, but this is a, a, an animation that we put together for our press release at, at uh, NASA headquarters to show what we think happens on Pluto. We don't have charged particles from magnetosphere, but we think there's still enough sunlight to break apart the methane, initiate the same sequence of reactions that form ethane and acetylene and other hydrocarbons. These build up in the atmosphere until they start condensing into particles, haze particles, and ion molecule reactions then operate on those haze particles, convert them into tholins, this group of, of hydrocarbons that give Pluto its color. They have different colors on different planets. On Pluto, it's a reddish type color. Lots of details are left out of this, um, and that's going to be some interesting science that we do over the next uh, year or two, and that's where we get the, the color of Pluto. Okay. This was our first picture of the atmosphere of Pluto. This is looking back at Pluto after the close encounter. And what you're seeing here is sunlight backlighting the atmosphere and being ref refract reflected towards you. Now, the reflection comes about because of small particles in the atmosphere. And these small particles are essentially a haze layer. It's a global haze layer. And so that halo, that arc that you see there, is due to haze particles in the atmosphere. And they have structure. This is the scale. And you can even see the structure in this image. Again, if, I don't want to ask for the lights to go down again, but you can probably see it. If you look carefully, you can see that there appears to be layered structure here. And that is not expected, um, at least in that manner. Um, if you take a cross section of the haze layer, compress it, and then artificially color it to bring out the differences in, in the uh, Ref uh, differences in the amount of uh, reflection, you can see that there appear to be regions that are almost uniform in altitude, 30, 50 miles. There appear to be haze layers, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. There appear to be wave-like structures here as well. So those, you know, we're, we're in discussions right now whether this is waves, due to waves in the atmosphere or due to layering of some sort of atmospheric phenomenon, uh, or maybe both. Um, but whatever it is, this is probably our first peek at weather on Pluto. But there is a bit of a mystery here. Uh, this haze layer extends out to about 100 miles, 160 kilometers from the surface. We did expect a haze layer, but we expected it about 10 to maybe 20, maybe even 30 kilometers from the surface. And the reason is because the haze should be formed when you have hydrocarbons that build up to abundances that make them supersaturated in the lower atmosphere where it's cold. And that happens very close to the surface, not at 150 kilometers above the surface. In fact, the surface is around 30 to maybe 60 degrees Kelvin. 
where we see the haze layer is up there where it's around 100 degrees Kelvin, which is the hottest region of the atmosphere. Now, hot for Pluto is not what we would call hot, but 100 degrees Kelvin is hot. And so we see haze particles where it's hot, not where it's cold. On Earth, we have condensation of clouds where it gets cold, not where it warms up. So that's a bit of a mystery. There are other mysteries. One has to deal with the surface pressure. Now, if you remember, um, I said that you know, Pluto is in a very eccentric orbit. It uh, was closest to the sun in 1989, and now it's moving away from the sun. <clears throat> it has mostly a nitrogen atmosphere, which is in equilibrium, saturation vapor pressure equilibrium, with nitrogen ice on the surface. That equilibrium is a very sensitive function of temperature. You raise the temperature, the amount of nitrogen gas goes up. You lower the temperature, nitrogen condenses out. That's what we expected to happen as Pluto moves away from the sun. It is getting colder, and the nitrogen ice should be building up because the atmosphere is condensing. And this shows um, a plot of surface pressure uh, as a function of year. And the white dots show some measurements over the years. And there are two models on this, on this figure. The models show what is expected for the surface pressure on Pluto as a function of time, as Pluto is moving away from the sun. It was closest in 1989. The heat from the sun should build the atmosphere up. The peak in surface pressure, though, doesn't occur right then. It's like the hottest part of the day. That occurs like 1.30 to 2 p.m. in the afternoon, not at noon. So the temperature should go up, the amount of uh, nitrogen ice that evaporates into the atmosphere should go up, and you should have a peak in the surface pressure about the year 2000 or something like that, plus or minus a few years. The white dots are measurements that have been made from stellar occultation measurements over the past 25 years. And you can see the first two seem to match a couple of the models, but the recent ones seem to suggest that the atmosphere has been increasing in its pressure. Well, the Rex radio science experiment, which again measures the transmission of radio waves through the atmosphere, is a very precise way to measure the surface pressure. And what it measured was a value of about half of what the most recent stellar occultation measurement gave. So this is very, very tentative. Uh, we have um, a lot of work to do on this, but it seems to suggest that the atmosphere may be entering a time period when it is indeed beginning to condense, to collapse. But the rate would be astonishing. This would mean that the mass of the atmosphere would decrease by a factor of two in two years. That, that would really be uh, a, a, a keen mystery. So the surface pressure is a mystery. We don't understand the details of this just yet. We're not even sure how accurate the, the numbers are. Okay, I think I'm just about out of time. So I just want to show uh, one more picture of Pluto and talk about what's coming uh, in the future. And I'll try this animation or this uh, set of images. We'll see if, they, if it works. Okay, just like before, looking back at Pluto, uh, I'll play it again, and looking at sunlight scattered through the atmosphere. And uh, you can see a lot of interesting things. Unfortunately, it goes too rapidly. But you can see little spots where the light is coming through. Uh, looks like crevices on the limb, which are probably in between mountains. And you can see variations in the haze on one side to the other. And it's really going to be an interesting study to figure out what's causing that haze. It looks like a halo. So Pluto has a halo, too, a heart and a halo, a whale and a donut. <laughs> OK, so what's to come? Well, the spacecraft is still healthy. It's still so it has half a tank of gas, and so it's moving outwards. And the plan all along has been that if things looked well, we were going to visit another Kuiper Belt object. And so for the past half decade or so, there's been a search along, along the region of the sky that would follow the path of the spacecraft, and several candidate Kuiper Belt objects have been identified. Um, there are three PT-1, PT-2, and PT-3, no, no interesting names. But the one that was, um, well, the one that is most likely to be chosen is this one, PT-1, and there's a picture of it. It's going to be smaller than Pluto. Um, it's going to be uh, you know, just a few tens of kilometers across. But it's going to be interesting to see if something even this small in the outer solar system, OK, I'm out of time, is as interesting as Pluto and Charon. OK, so I'll end with that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
Okay, I'm told I have time for questions. Yeah. It seems remarkable that both the number of satellites and the size of the largest one relative to the, to the size of Pluto, which we only see with the Earth moon system. Mm -hmm. Are there theories of the origin of those satellites and whether they are mm -hmm. permanent companions or whether some of those might be in unstable orbits that were just captured and are not going to be there in 200 million years? Oh, very, very interesting question. Um, again, not my field, uh, but uh, I followed the discussion on that, and the consensus seems to be that the origin was in a collision early in the history of, of Pluto. It was probably soon after its formation that formed Charon. The other objects are in fairly stable orbits, but their orbits are not perfectly stable. They're a little bit chaotic, but they seem to be stable on the time scale of hundreds of millions of years. So it looks like we have a reasonably stable system, but with any chaotic system, you can't predict very far in the future. Charon is certainly very stable, and it's certainly a very old companion. Yeah? Um, the rotates, right? Pluto rotates with a period of about 6.4 days, yeah. So the of atmosphere, yeah. how far out does it follow the rotation? Very good question. Uh, something that um, has a lot of physics in it. In summary, we don't know, okay? We're not even sure we can calculate how this transition from a fluid occurs into molecular flow. But the idea that the rotation itself is carried into the gas that's escaping is something that has to occur, conservation of angular momentum. If you've got a rotating atmosphere here and the atmosphere is moving out, it's still rotating. You know, is there a friction that's causing the atmosphere to be accelerated out there? We don't know. That, that's a very interesting question, but several people are working on that. I think over here. Uh, yes, curious the percentage of uh, lake or ice, whether it's yeah. nitrogen or water, to regolith or other surface. Yeah, the, uh, the nitrogen glacier is about 4% of the surface. Um, and the estimates are that it's you know maybe a one or two or three kilometers thick. These are very uncertain estimates. The 4% is pretty good, the thickness is very uncertain. You work out the numbers, that's on the order of a million cubic kilometers of solid nitrogen ice. And that's the glacier, that's the, the right ventricle of the heart. Right, but what about, I'm talking about the, the I'm gonna call it a planet, the planet itself. The non-glaciated region. Yeah, what's the percentage of non-glaciated to glaciated and the, and the, uh, the uh, ice mountains, you know? So the glaciated versus non-glaciated. Well, the glaciated is 4%. Okay. 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 Uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, on each side. Yeah. That must also affect the vapor pressure of the nitrogen. Of course. On yeah. each side and the gas wings. Very good question. Um, there's several parts to it. One is that there's a day night difference in temperature just because it's rotating. And the equilibrium is going to change. You know, it's going to be hotter in the day, cooler at night. But also, if you look at the, the images, there are dark regions and bright regions. The dark regions are going to be hotter than the light regions. And so there's going to be a lot of different, there's a wide range of temperatures, both on the day side and the night side, in addition to it being a day night difference as well. That should, and we believe that it does, set up ice flow, I mean ice winds, or, or winds that are made of ice that's sublimating, and the pressure differences between the high pressure and the low pressure is causing winds to flow. But it's complicated. Like I said, the temperature varies day, night, and then locally because of the reflectivity variation. And then also, Pluto is rotating, and that affects the direction of the winds. So again, this is something that you have to model with a global circulation model, a GCM, like they have on the Earth, and that is being done. And we do expect there to be ice transport by that mechanism. Now, the winds are not uh, extremely strong. You're talking about maybe 10 meters a second, something like that. Um, so they're not unbelievable. They're fairly reasonable. Yeah. Uh, the uh, eccentric fault is, is it has something to do with the original collision of the hmm. or you know that? Oh, we have no idea. Or at least I have no idea. And then the other thing is, is it a possibility maybe surprise the fact that Pluto is now the largest object? Would I be, is the question, would I be surprised if we find that Pluto is not the largest object in the Kuiper Belt? I would not be surprised in the least. Not in the least. I wouldn't be surprised if there are 10 more. Yeah. 
Where is the spacecraft headed? Uh, away from the sun. Yes. It is in a solar escape orbit. It has enough velocity to leave the solar system. Uh, and so it's going to go into interstellar space. I th yeah. Uh, how long would the spacecraft survive with the power? Well, the propellant is something you choose how to use that. The power is uh, radioactive plutonium. And it looks like it's decaying at a rate where we could still power the, the spacecraft, in particular the radio experiment, for maybe 10, 15 years. But it's going to get progressively much more difficult to detect. Okay? And that goes as the square of the distance, yeah. Um, an orbital mission around Pluto. Yeah, Pluto yeah. How long would it take to get there? Right, because if you're, if you're doing an orbital mission, mm -hmm. you have to go slower. Right. Well, you, you have to speed up to get there. They have to slow down to get into orbit. You can't use aero braking. The atmosphere is not going to be thick enough for that. You have to carry a lot of propellant to slow you down. And that was the main reason that we didn't even contemplate using an orbiter. That's usually the next step in planetary exploration, flyby, then orbiter, then possibly a lander and rover and so on. Um, yeah, it's going to take much bigger spacecraft. And how long it takes dep it depends upon how big it is and how much fuel you can take, how fast you can make it, how, how much fuel you can keep to slow it down. Uh, but Pluto is very far away. You know, the sun is eight light minutes. Pluto is four and a half light hours. Four and a half hours after something happens there, we can know about it. In the back of the uh, No, that's a good point. We're, we're 32 times as far from the sun as the Earth is. That means that the brightness of the sun is down by a factor of 1,000 or so. So, yeah, it's going to be pretty dim. It's going to be a lot like twilight that we would have on the Earth. Of course, the, the cameras are very sensitive. So the images you see in terms of the brightness are not, that doesn't represent the brightness that you would see with your eye. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, the atmosphere uh, tends to be rather cold right at the surface, and the temperature increases as you move up with altitude. There is you know, a comparison with other planetary atmospheres. If you get above the troposphere of the Earth, the temperature increases because of the ozone layer. On the sun, you have a really different range of physical things going on. You have a low temperature photosphere of around 6,000 degrees, 10,000 degrees, and then the atmosphere gets up to millions of degrees. And that's due to uh, magnetohydrodynamic uh, dissipation, all sorts of interesting things. I think it's a different realm of physical things going on there. Yeah. Why don't we just crash it into that thing? <laughs> um, that's an interesting scenario. Um, <laughs> you could write a proposal to NASA is all I can say. Yeah, um, yeah crashing spacecraft into objects is sometimes interesting. We've done it for the moon and Mercury, you know, and you know, even Jupiter. And, and so you can sometimes learn things from doing that, but that wasn't uh, in our... Uh, um, you know, our top science priority list. I'm sorry? Yeah, wait till the power is almost dead and do something creative like smashing the spacecraft into a Kuiper Belt object. <laughs> yeah, we, again, we haven't really thought about it. We'll, we'll consider it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that, that does put a damper on things. Yeah. 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 
Is it cold enough to do something that we've never seen before? Well, you know, uh, personally, I would say yes. Uh, but we don't know if we've never seen it before. By definition, we can't really be certain. But we have other systems where we see really interesting things happen when you go to low temperatures or high pressure. Like even water, everybody thinks it has three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, but it has over 10. You go to different temperature pressure regimes, you see different orientations of the molecules. And the same thing happens with ices. When you go through different temperature regimes, the molecules rearrange themselves. And so inside of Pluto, you know, we suspect that because there's a resurfacing process going on, there's got to be something inside that's heating materials so they become buoyant and get to the surface. What that is, we don't know. But if there's some heating going on inside, that could lead to a lot of interesting things that might be surprising to us because we have no experience with 100 degree Kelvin nitrogen water ice at 1,000 megabars. I mean, we just don't know. We see really surprising things happen when we get uh, materials at different pressure and temperature regimes than we're familiar with. So I would say yes, but nobody knows until you really do it. It's so complicated, yeah. not nearly enough heat, not even close to being enough heat. And there's another problem with that. The solar heat would be at the surface. You need something subsurface to be heated to get buoyancy and get stuff coming out of the interior. Good question, though. OK, I, I think that means one minute. One more question. Going once? OK, well, thank you.